Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Sometimes the best way to find a living is to stay right where you are and study with UAS online. Career-specific distance programs from the University of Alaska Southeast are the fastest way to increase your earning power. We connect all over the world. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm the Hoary Marmot, and the Hoary Marmot says it's still winter in Alaska, but the weather pattern hasn't changed, so it may be unusually warm where you are, or maybe not. There's certainly some cold pockets around Alaska, but it is Groundhog Day, and as such, we pay quick respect to the rodents that, of weather prognostication and then shoo them on their way because they, they're just rodents. It's the 2nd of February. As always, weather.gov slash Alaska is your place for weather and climate prognostications. The weather info line is open at 800-472-0391, and these guys have big old teeth, so don't mess with them too much. Around Thompson Pass, a blowing snow advisory is in effect for late tonight and tomorrow. Again, poor visibility going over the pass should be expected thanks to gusty winds. We have seen gusty winds across most of the Gulf Coast today, but even with the tightening pressure gradient, the gusts haven't been really over 30 miles per hour or so. Looking ahead to tomorrow, we know that cold is usually on order this time of the year. This was one of the coldest months, of course, as we head through February. As the sun is starting to come back, the cold is still trying to keep its grip on Alaska. And if you remember back in 1947, as some of you surely do, it was a cold day in South Central and likely many other places, but record cold in these locations. Golcana, 65 below. We know it gets cold there. That was one of the coldest. Kenai, 45 below. When the weather station was at Merrill Field on, in 1947, the temperature dropped to 38 below on the third. Palmer hit 37 below. Cordova, 33 below. And Seward, 17 below. That's a lot of cold at the coast. What was going on? Well, we had a prolonged cold spell that was uh, setting temperatures into record levels for many south central locations there, including the ones you see here in 1947. A few days later, though, a really interesting thing happened, of course, as sometimes does happen. It goes from really cold to really warm. It flipped about well, 80 to 90 degrees into the positive 40s and 50s for a large part of the region. So it can change that quick. And well, that's always a good lesson to use today wisely, no matter what the weather, no matter what the season, right? Here's a look at the satellite picture across all of Alaska. And as we look into the interior, once again, the murky colors you see here across the interior is simply some of that cold air lingering around Fort Yukon, where temperatures started out at 20 below this morning, not record setting. Low pressure across the central and southern Gulf is sweeping a frontal boundary northward, but the colder and drier air that's in place and the jet stream that's moving it all around is really limiting how far north that can go. So we're going to see this air mass spread out across the Gulf and work a lot of its moisture into the northern Bering Sea. We have another wave of low pressure out across the west. It's really not much to write home about. You can see it's got a lot of dry air and cold air wrapped in, and it's really far falling apart and absorbing itself into part of this overall circulation. So watch this loop one more time. We have low pressure spreading out across the Gulf, more of a southeasterly flow that's going to tighten up across southeastern Alaska as we get into the next couple days. Watch for the winds to come up here and all the way around the Gulf as we go ahead in time. Uh, the frontal boundary will start to work its way into the southern Bering Sea and the Bristol Bay region. It will bring a better chance of rainfall into places like Kodiak and the Alaska Peninsula. It's going to pick up the rainfall again across southeast, but you're going to notice the winds, I think, more than anything else all the way around the Gulf Coast. Meanwhile, dry conditions prevail across the interior, across the west coast, and across the north, but as that low pressure system moves northward, it's also tightening the pressure gradient up north. So we're going to see winds develop here. And once again, that bl uh, blowing snow will be more of a predominant feature in your weather pattern and gusty winds as well. So watch for alerts on that in the coming days, uh, especially if you've got some loose snow still sitting on the ground. 
Now, today's weather map shows some light rainfall across the outer coast of southeast, a few snow showers in the northern end, rainfall across western Prince William Sound down into Seward, and the northern half of Kodiak Island was seeing some light rain. Once again, you can see all the clouds stretching on the north end of the frontal boundary, sweeping into places like St. Paul and St. George, St. Matthew, with a little bit of ice growing there on the western end of the island, and then cold air across the north with several waves of low pressure working from southeast to north and west. Each one of these is capable of stirring up the wind and blowing the snow around. The better chance of precipitation that's organized in any way could be some snow showers across the Chukchi Sea coast and across the eastern tip of Siberia and north and including parts of St. Matthew. You'll see some snow around St. Paul and St. George, rain and snow across the southern Bering Sea coast as well as around the Alaska Peninsula and and you're looking at uh, the frontal boundary still creeping northward. Low pressure will continue trekking northward to about 963 millibars as we get into areas just south of Sandpoint. For uh, regions outside of Prince William Sound, expect some light rainfall there. Uh, tightening the pressure gradient again across southeastern Alaska, some light snow across the western Alaska range, and rain and snow could be pushed as far north as St. Paul and St. George. Snow showers a little bit more likely as you head into the western and southern Bering Sea for the central and western chain. And for the interior, once again, generally a clear and dry day, but a blustery day at that as the winds continue to pick up. As we get into Thursday, a 961 millibar low will sit just south of Kodiak Island and east of Sandpoint. Uh, that's going to change the wind direction around a little bit more as we get into Thursday and Friday for parts of the uh, Bristol Bay region all the way out toward the central Aleutians. That's also strengthening a southerly flow into the northern Gulf Coast, including Prince William Sound and over the Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island. Watch for some gusty winds there, and again, that will include places like Thompson Pass where we expect the snow uh, to fall a little bit, but blowing snow to be even more of an issue. As we look across southeast, you can see the winds are also tightening up here. Periods of rain and snow at elevation, and the weakening system will continue trekking eastward away from uh, most of the central gulf. We may see a few more clouds move into the southern Brooks Range as well as parts of the upper Yukon Valley. With those clouds comes an opportunity for a few passing snow showers, but once again, winds will probably be the predominant feature. And on top of cold, that could mean some dangerous wind chills. Across southeast, look for temps today and making it into the upper 30s to mid 40s. Sitka, one of the warmer spots. Also, Klawak, a warmer day today. 37 around Cordova, 22 in Anchorage with Homer and Seward in the 30s and 40s, respectfully. Zero in Fairbanks, 12 below in Eagle as the shadows are starting to show up and the day is getting just a little longer for you as well. 11 below in Fort Yukon. It was three above in Bettles, nine below in Kaktovik, 12 below for Atkasuk, but seven below in Barrow. Around Kivalina, it made it to 24 today. Kotzebue was 14, 16 for our friends in Shishmaref, 24 in Nome, 11 in Unil uh, 22 in Unilakleet, 16 around um, uh, areas around Ruby and Grayling, and 9 degrees there in uh, Galena itself, 5 above in McGrath, 23 around Bethel today, 25 in McCoryuk, 21 for Gamble and St. Lawrence Island. For southwestern Alaska today, we saw temps in the lower to mid 20s and 30s there, Lake Iliamna 27 in fact, 37 in Kodiak, 39 in Akiak, and um, temps in the mid to upper 30s for the southern end of the Alaska Peninsula. St. Paul and St. George made it above freezing, but uh, that was not the case for Adak and Atka, both in the upper 20s, and Shemia was showing only 26. Overnight low temperatures in Fort Yukon will be some of the coldest, but Arctic Village looks to be even colder at 24, 10 below for Barrow tonight. Look for areas out in the YK Delta in the teens and mid-20s. A little bit further down the Alaska Peninsula coastline, lower to mid-30s should be expected, 36 around Kodiak. Look for 21 in Anchorage, 11 around uh, Talkeetna, Healy, about one below. The central and western chain closer to 30 degrees, St. Paul near 31, southeast in the upper 30s to about 40 degrees with highs tomorrow in the upper 30s and lower 40s there. South central, expect highs in the uh, low to mid 30s, 42 in Kodiak, 11 in Fairbanks, 5 below for Arctic Village and temps hovering close to but not quite making it to the zero degree mark for the Arctic coast. For the Seward Peninsula, teens and low 20s, Nome about 21. Uh, Amonic around 16, 21 for Nunavak Island, 18 around St. Lawrence, 34 in St. Paul, and 30s and 40s for the Alaska Peninsula, with most areas not making it a whole lot warmer than what Kodiak should see tomorrow at 42. On the flying weather, MVFR conditions are expected for most of southeast. All the way around the northern Gulf Coast, you'll see even increased or poor visibility around Prince William Sound on the eastern side of the Kenai Peninsula as that warm and wet air is running into the Chugach Range, as well as areas in the western Alaska Range. From St. Matthew all the way down to St. Paul and St. George and into uh, places in the eastern Aleutians, uh, including Dutch Harbor and Alaska, Akatan, 
and probably not quite as far east as Saint uh, or as Sand Point, but maybe Cold Bay and False Pass. You'll probably see IFR conditions tomorrow, so be extra careful there. And around the Chukchi Sea coast, uh, west towards Siberia, uh, you'll see a little bit of improvement around Point Barrow, but just south of that, especially across the coastal plain, look for MVFR conditions throughout most of the day. Here's your pass conditions now. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to be VFR through most of the day. Very dry and cold conditions, but uh, visibility should be okay. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will probably start at MVFR throughout the day and then lean over toward IFR conditions as we go throughout your Thursday, or your Wednesday, I should say. It'd be nice if it was Thursday. Rainy Pass, MVFR conditions on to VFR throughout the day. And Windy Pass, we expect to be breezy, but uh, VFR conditions through your entire day. Same goes for Isabel Pass. Things look pretty good there tomorrow. As we get into Mentasta Pass, MVFR conditions should be expected. And, of course, as you move onward toward Tanita Pass, MVFR is expected there. We expect to see Portage Pass, generally the eastern side and Prince William Sound side, at IFR through a good chunk of the day with a lot of low clouds and rain and snow. And Chilkoot and White Pass may see some improvements during the day, but we'll start out around IFR throughout your Wednesday. Now, uh, freezing levels. You can see that warm air is spreading out over the Gulf once again. Just a few days ago, it was really concentrated ahead of the front across the eastern Gulf, and now it's all mixing up once again. The 2,000-foot freezing line trying to make a run inland west of the Alaska Range. The surface freezing line showing that warm air has accumulated north of the Pribilovs, but still south of St. Matthew and then sneaking eastward once again across Adak and Atka. Still in the same old place though for southeastern Alaska. Icing potential then, it is increasing. More and more moisture is spreading northward and quickly, but below 4,000 feet seems to be the cutoff line there, so if you can get above that, the threat should go down. Occasional moderate for Prince William Sound all the way into southeast, and also across uh, Kodiak Island, west toward the Pribilovs, and south toward the central Aleutians, and across the Alaska Peninsula. The jet stream is really showing a very little change in its main path. That main path I'm talking about is this superhighway that you see cutting across the North Pacific at 160 knots. The things that are changing, though, is the orientation of the ridge. Uh, the trough and the fast-moving part is still in place, but the ridge of high pressure is kind of leaning over a little bit more and a little bit more. So this will be interesting to see how this changes eventually. For right now, it's working its way out of the west coast and into the northern Arctic and then dropping all of the cold into the continental United States. If you're paying attention to the news elsewhere in the United States tonight, you'll notice that they have a pretty decent blizzard going on across the central plains. That's a big deal, but it is all part of the same weather system that's keeping us mild and dry for most locations of the interior and certainly south central and southwest and southeast, keeping things a little bit on the uh, not as snowy side, at least for January in Juneau. At 9,000 feet, you can see the circulation still in place just south and west of Kodiak Island. That broad southerly flow sweeping over southeast at about 35 to 50 knots. Interior winds coming in from east to west, 25 to 30 knots there. The Arctic coast around 25 knots. Offshore winds along the west, west coast, 30 to 40 knots at top speed. And north and westerly winds cutting across the central and western chain on the south side of that low pressure trough there that extends all the way out into the western bearing. At 3,000 feet, it's pretty much stacked and packed at this level, just like at 9,000 feet. Southerlies working across the Gulf at 30 to 50 knots there. The strongest winds closer to the low and south of Kodiak Island. Easterlies are cutting across the western Alaska Range, 20 to 40 knots there. Offshore winds blowing across Seward Peninsula and Nome. 15 to 20 knots there and over Kotzebue Sound a little bit slower there moving off the Brooks Range. Look for an easterly flow also across the coastal plain at 20 to 30 knots there and southerlies uh, still blowing into southeast around 20 to 30 at 3,000 feet. So what about turbulence? Well, we do see some thumps and bumps there around the uh, middle Yukon Valley and westward into Kotzebue Sound and northern sections of Norton Sound generally below 2,000 feet. For southeastern Alaska below 5,000 feet, especially in the inner channels there probably reaching occasional moderate at times tomorrow. For Prince William Sound and parts of Cook Inlet with air rolling over some of that higher terrain, there's a decent possibility we'll set up a few uh, wave clouds there, and you know what that means. Watch out for turbulence below, and below 4,000 feet is where we expect to find a lot of that, especially around Bristol Bay and the Aleutian Range all the way into the Alaska Peninsula. Elsewhere in the central chain, probably looking at some light chop, maybe isolated moderate, and some of that could extend eastward into Dutch Harbor and Alaska and Akatan tomorrow. That's a look at your aviation forecast. In just a few moments, we'll be back with a look at your sea ice edge and the rest of your marine weather. Stay tuned.
Hello again, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service with another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And joining me today are not just one, but two people, both with the last name Stevens, which is even more fun, but no relation. We have Eric Stevens from Gina mm -hmm. and George Stevens, who is a mechanical engineering student from the University of Alaska mm -hmm. Fairbanks. Did I get that right? Yep. Awesome. And today you guys brought a really cool toy or I should say tool with you. It's a sandbox, but why are you guys working on a sandbox? Well, it's part of our senior design project and we were approached by um, EPSCOR to build, build this from, for them. Mm -hmm. They uh, uh, had a proof of concept that they developed years, years, about a year ago, I think. And um, the, uh, uh, they wanted a more robust ver version that they mm -hmm. could pack onto a plane and take places. And it's a handy learning tool for kids and, all, and adults. So you're a mechanical engineering student. You've built a traveling sandbox for the experimental program to stimulate competitive research EPSCOR, and Gina's facilitated this. But why do we need a traveling sandbox? Well, the, the uh, prototype was such a big hit that uh, they decided they wanted another one, actually two, that, they could act that would be easier to travel with, you know, um, possibly marketable even. Okay, so this is a traveling sandbox. It's got a lot of bits and pieces and, and a computer hooked up to it. What is the computer doing with the sand? The computer actually uses a Kinect sensor to read the topography of the sand or the shape of the sand, mm -hmm. which, and then the computer translates that into information which it projects using a projector onto the sand showing topographical lines and which is representative of the shape of the sand. Okay, so this is a live mapping tool? Yeah. It's interactive. As you're moving your hands through it, it is actively following and changing the lines to fit what you're doing. That sounds like something I could have in my backyard. Yeah. It would be a lot of fun. <laughs> so you guys had to change the design a little bit to make this more Alaskified, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, how'd you do that? Well, um, the original was made out of basically lumber and Simpson strong tie type mm -hmm. stuff. And we re rebuilt it to make it lighter and basic and basically more transportable we can pack it down to a fairly small size and it can be loaded onto a plane and flown anywhere in the state which you guys did today and you yep. have plans to take this in other places of alaska right yep we're actually going to be headed down to homer with it later today okay very good eric how mm -hmm. does this fit into uh science learning around alaska well you know what i think it is a tool and it is a toy and yes. it brings out a smile from an eight-year-old oh, yeah. and the smile from a 48-year-old oh, with yeah. that inner eight-year-old yes. wanting to get out. The, uh, the sandbox, it's an interactive learning tool that teaches us how topography in the three dimensions is related to, say, a two-dimensional map. More about that later. Just like George was saying, it's got a connect sensor, not just for video games anymore. It can sense out the, the lay of the land there, yeah. feeds that information in the computer. computer identifies that, sends a signal to a, pro a projector to send topographic land lines to map over that that uh, lumpy ground so right. you get a three-dimensional topo map out of it and my favorite thing about it this is the thing that stops people at the the trade show they stop at your booth and, and sure. don't leave is that you run your hand through that sandbox and it responds in in real time it remaps cool. the, top, the topography as you get to be Mr. Tectonic Plate Drifter <laughs> there. You can make things how you want. Well, what if we made a really high mountain here and a low valley there, and the lines adjust to what you did? It's a learning tool because it, yeah. it shows you that connection between these two-dimensional topo lines and, and what's really out in Alaska. And Alaska's a place with all kinds of topography. Mm -hmm. You know, we're from the Great Plains, where your topo maps tend to be just like blank pieces of paper. But Alaska is particularly gifted in this regard, and, and this tool helps us, I think, learn more about our state, really. Absolutely. And so this is going to enha enhance uh, STEM learning, the science, technology, engineering, and math, in, in many different uh, locations around Alaska. Then this would be something that kids and teachers can get their hands on. Mm -hmm. It sure is. And I mentioned the, uh, it's, it's like flypaper at a booth <laughs> that, or, or at the uh, science potpourri, when we had Greg's original version of this sandbox, and okay. that one was made out of scraps of wood, and it, it was a prototype. But even that one, before it had some of the refinements that, that George and crew have made for this newer, right. um, upscaled, maybe a 2.0 version of the sandbox, okay. even that one was so attractive to people. It just demonstrated that this, this has potential to be a learning tool, an outreach tool, an education tool um, that can now is portable and can go places in Alaska 
Um, of course, there's only one sandbox, can't be everywhere at once, but hopefully it gets out there, gets the word out about EPSCOR and, and what science is being done here for Alaskans. All right, that sounds really interesting, and I can't wait to get my hands in the sand and try this out for myself. Mm -hmm. We're going to demonstrate this here in our next segment of Alaska Weather Facts, but before we go, we want to remind you that EPSCOR, which is a, a new acronym for me now, but I'm going to remember this because you can follow them on Facebook and Twitter, and I invite you to do that. Alaska EPSCOR uh, is also uh, something that facilitates science learning at uh, the University of Alaska around the state, and that stands for Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. So check that out, and make sure you tune in tomorrow because we're going to have the next version where we actually get our hands in the sand and check out how this works and demonstrates that topography. So for now, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with this edition of Alaska Weather Facts and we'll see you again next time. Dillingham, Knack Neck in view, Tin City, and you can see there's still lower concentration ice around St. Lawrence Island, but look right here, that's St. Matthew, and there is some newer ice in the last couple days shaping up on the western end of the island. So the ice edge is advancing southward, you know, slowly, but it, it is moving, and with a prediction of the winds kind of coming around to more of a north and northwesterly flow in the western bearing, we'll likely see that ice edge start to move a little bit further south in time. In the meantime, uh, still uh, some open areas or at least lower concentration ice across the northern parts of the YK Delta and into the northern edge of uh, Norton Sound and off the western tip of the Seward Peninsula also have a few areas of uh, lower concentration ice up across the Chukchi Sea coast and Cook Inlet also showing a little bit of expanding ice slowly coming down Cook Inlet there toward uh, the uh, uh, the northern edge of Calgan Island, not quite that far south, but you can see the ice is certainly uh, increasing a little bit more with time. So that's your update on the sea ice edge. Here's a look at southeastern Alaska now. Southeast winds will be predominant across the central and southern parts of the inner channels, 25 to 35 knots with seas around 5 to 7 feet. Building up to 21 feet as you head up toward Yakutat and outside of Cross Sound, uh, 40 knot winds there, 35 knots a little bit further south of Sitka in the Dixon entrance. Winds come around to more of a southerly flow on Thursday, looking at uh, southerlies increasing up the Lynn Canal as we head into Thursday as well. 20 knot winds there, 4 to 5 foot seas. As south of that, as high as 12 foot seas as you get out toward the ocean entrances there. South and southeasterly winds continue on the outer coast, 35 to 40, and seas again up around 21 to as high as 22 feet outside of Dixon entrance. For south central, northeasterly winds coming down Cook Inlet, starting out around 25 knots in the northern inlet over some of the ice in the open water, 6 foot seas there, and then building rapidly to 16 foot seas on a 40 knot wind all the way into Shelikoff Strait. Look for north and easterly winds coming across Prince William Sound inside 30 knots there, 40 knot winds out over the Gulf and heading into areas east of the Barrens and Kodiak Island with a 23 foot sea there. Thursday, a little bit of a southeasterly shift. Winds come up to 45 knots, 21 to 22 foot seas. So uh, look for easterlies inside of Prince William Sound at 30 knots and 40 to 45 knots on the southern end of Cook Inlet and into areas west of the Barrens with a 20 foot sea there. So uh, winds certainly coming up more as we head into Thursday. So be advised of those changes. For the Alaska Peninsula and Bristol Bay, look for a northeasterly flow at 40 knots, a little bit further down the coast. Not a whole lot of change in the wind speed, but 14-foot seas should be expected there. 22-foot seas there from Castle Cape to Chignik, and slower winds from the north and east, 30 knots so around Sand Point and westward, 19-foot seas expected there. For Thursday, the winds come around to a southwesterly direction, 25 knots with a 12-foot sea. Northeasterlies continue on the Bering Sea coast and inside of Bristol Bay. Easterlies drive into Chignik there in Castle Cape, 30 knots with a 14-foot sea on Thursday. For the Aleutians, northerlies are taking over from Unalaska all the way out toward Adak where they become a little more westerly. Uh, look for 20 to 30 knots in those regions, 13 to 16 foot seas along the Pacific coast, 25 to 35 knots there. For Thursday, a little bit more of a westerly shift, 35 to 40 knots, uh, looking for 14 to 18 foot seas on the south side and 13 to 15 foot seas, a little bit lower seas there between Nikolsky and Atka and a west-northwesterly flow from Kiska to Attu with a 9 to 11 foot sea on Thursday. 
for the West Coast. Northeasterlies at 25 to 40, the higher winds there outside of Kuskokwim Bay with a 12-foot sea. Over the ice we go at 30 knots, and that comes into about 7-foot seas around St. Matthew. Again, this pattern should help to build more ice into the region. Northeasterlies around St. Paul and St. George, 25 knots with a 9-foot sea on Wednesday. That becomes more northerly with time, and seas build to 11 feet there. 30 knot winds over St. Lawrence Island, 30 knots over St. Matthew with a 10 foot sea, and winds diminish inside of the Kuskokwim Bay, uh, 30 knots with a 9 foot sea for Thursday. Across the north slope, easterlies are blowing at 25 knots, slowing down a little bit around Wainwright to Point Lay, and then picking up from the north and east at 20 knots. As we look at Thursday, winds really pick up around Cape Lisburn and Point Hope to 40 knots. Northerlies outside of Kotzebue Sound at 20 knots, and east and northeasterly winds for the Beaufort Sea Coast still holding around 25 knots, a little bit more windy. Uh, for Wainwright and Point Lay coming in at 30 knots from the north and east on Thursday. Recapping tonight's weather map, uh, low pressure will continue working itself north, northward. This is not 931. This should be 961, so don't worry too much there. Pockets of light rainfall across southeast, and we'll see some snow showers around the Kenai Peninsula and the western Alaska Range. For the interior, more clear skies, and we just got an alert from the uh, uh, Space Weather Prediction Center that there's a little bit of an extra activity coming at the Earth tonight, so maybe tonight's a good night for the Aurora, but the winds may be picking up in some of those gap-prone areas, so watch for the cold to settle in again as we get into Wednesday. Overall, the weather pattern's lifting northward with pockets of rain again for southeast and Prince William Sound. Kodiak Island and the Alaska Peninsula with a 963 low just around Sand Point. Waves of low pressure continue working westward, and you'll see some snow showers across the west coast as well as the central and western sections of the Bering Sea. Blowing snow could be a possibility for your day if you're trying to get through Thompson Pass tomorrow. An advisory is posted for that, so be extra careful with your travel plans if you're going to or from the Valdez area. For Thursday, low pressure right along the western tip of Kodiak Island working north and west. More wind coming our way for south central as well. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.